Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our spring seminar series hosted by the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. As you by now know, each year we invite international scholars working on different aspects of Hellenic studies to present their research on a wide range of topics in fields as diverse as archeology, span classics, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern Greek history, as well as literary and cultural studies. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event was organized at Simon Fraser University on Burnaby Mountain, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Slaytooth, Musqueam, and Coquitlam peoples. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would also like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about SFU's Zoom privacy and security gu guidelines, I ask you to visit the SFU IT Services website. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will host a Q&A session. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation, and we will try to do our best to address them afterwards. If you would like to ask a question orally, please use the raise hand button and our event coordinator will unmute you. So I'm pleased to present today, Dr. Sakis Gekas, Associate Professor and Holder of the York University Hellenic Heritage Foundation Chair in Modern Greek History. Dr. Gekas works among other things on various aspects of Greek history of the 19th century with a focus on economic, social, and political history. His uh, books, pro book projects include Xenocracy, State Class and Colonialism in the Ionian Islands from 1815 to 1864, a book which will be published soon in uh, its Greek version as Xenocratia, Economia, Kinonia, ke Kratos, Teptanisa. His uh, forthcoming project and book is Talipsana to Agonos, Apomphachi, Hires, and Orphanaton Agonistons Epanastasis, 1821-1850, Relics of the Struggle, Veterans, Widows, and Orphans of the Revolution of 1821 to 1850. As you gather from these uh, very selective articles of uh, Dr. Gekas' uh, output, uh, he's um, very well positioned uh, to be talking to us in this uh, very interesting moment in uh, Greek history, 200 years from the uh, revolution of uh, 1821. And uh, I hope you will all enjoy today's presentation, uh, which is titled, uh, The Ionian Islands and British Intervention in the Greek Revolution of 1821. Please give a warm welcome to Sakis. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, Professor Kralis, for the kind invitation and the uh, very kind introduction. I want to start by saying um, that uh, I'm delighted to be participating to the seminar series, uh, of the webinar series, rather, uh, of uh, Simon Fraser. And uh, I'm uh, particularly grateful for this uh, introduction. I want to start. Um, quickly by saying uh, that uh, this is a uh, one, one chapter of uh, a, a work I've been doing on looking at aspects of uh, the Greek Revolution and its history from a, so to speak, decentered uh, point of view. And by this, I mean, uh, not just geographically, uh, which the Ionian Islands uh, kind of fall to this uh, category, but also uh, conceptually and to some extent uh, analytically uh, as well. There are uh, many events, as uh, Professor Kral has mentioned, that uh, is uh, that are that bring this uh, seminal event to uh, the uh, the for the present. And uh, if I may take uh, uh, your minds uh, off uh, for a little bit of the current uh, situation, which is you know dire in most parts uh, of the world, at least where uh, we are located, um, I will be grateful for any comments and questions uh, later on. So the journey goes, takes us back to uh, a place that is uh, fairly well known for uh, other things probably, but not so much uh, its participation to the Greek revolution of 1821. And uh, for these, uh, and for, um, for the, and this is something that we'll try to correct, uh, so to speak, by linking it to the British uh, intervention and involvement, the more broadly speaking, the engagement uh, with uh, the Greek war through uh, the Onion Islands. It is, um, it is part, this is part of an ongoing, uh, what I would call the imperial turn in the history of the Greek revolution, by which uh, I mean that there were uh, 
many, uh, it is acknowledged uh, more and more that there were many Greeks who lived in empires, not just obviously the Ottoman one where the revolution broke out, uh, but also in the Russian, uh, in the Habsburg uh, Empire, the British, the French, uh, and the Venetian in the case of the Ionian Islands until 1797. And this uh, diaspora of people, as is often called, uh, has uh, led to uh, more recently to an understanding of how people participated to the event, uh, to what extent they shaped the policies of the empires they lived, but also how they engaged with the revolution on the ground. And the Onion Islands are uh, probably one of the uh, best uh, places to look for this uh, connection. However, once you start approaching the history of the revolution from this point of view, a conceptual problem or issue, so to speak, uh, arises. Are Ionians part of the Greek diaspora, as it's been called, uh, that uh, gets involved, contributes in various ways to the revolution or not? And when did they become uh, part of the Greek nation as it emerges during and especially after uh, the revolution? And that is something that contemporaries, people who lived at the time and uh, arrived at the first at the uh, at the Ionian Islands uh, also addressed both foreigners and uh, Ionians. And the usual starting point, and I'm not innovating here, uh, but it's important to remember that a, a very important turning point is the arrival of the so-called Republican French in 1797, and for a brief period for about a year and a half until 1799. This is uh, the Republican phase in the island's history, which brought uh, quite a lot of important changes in, uh, in politics, if not in uh, society, there was no time uh, to do that, but it introduced a, a republicanism in uh, the islands that they had not experienced before. Uh, following that, uh, and during the Napoleonic Wars, the Onion Islands uh, became part of the Russian-Ottoman, uh, so to speak, alliance uh, temporary that lasted for only a few years, and they formed the Septimsula Republic, the first Greek state, as uh, Svoronos, Zahas, and other historians uh, have called it. This uh, first Greek state uh, was an uh, authoritarian, uh, more or less. Uh, they, it had some, it introduced especially uh, one constitution that was quite progressive, but overall, it became uh, the, the first testing ground for many of the ideas uh, that um, were uh, pop becoming more popular at the time about specifically about Greeks becoming a, a sort of uh, independent, if not independent, then an autonomous uh, state. Following the brief period of the Septinsula, as it was called the Seven Islands Republic, uh, the islands passed under French imperial rule. Uh, only Corfu though for about seven years. Uh, the Southern Islands, especially Zykinthos and Kefalonia were uh, occupied, were taken over by the British Navy uh, as early as 1809 and uh, Paxos uh, 1810. There is a growing historiography besides, uh, so to speak, this is the historical context uh, of the islands during the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there is a, a growing historiography of the British Empire and its uh, Mediterranean Empire uh, more specifically. Uh, but also the history of Russian engagement in the Mediterranean that uh, looks at specifically the role of the Onion Islands uh, as a, a testing ground and as a major field of expansion for Russian, uh, British and potentially French if they had not lost uh, the Napoleonic uh, Wars. So uh, I would like to uh, stress here that it is it hardly makes sense to see more broadly modern Greek history, the emergence of modern Greece as a state, uh, but also the history of the revolution, as I will uh, say in a minute, without taking into consideration the events uh, that uh, unfolded in the Ionian Islands between the period, the late 18th century and the outbreak of the revolution. I would also like to uh, suggest that the Onion Islands became even further a catalyst for the Greek Revolution in at least uh, three ways. So there are three factors, let's say, at least that entangled uh, the history of the Onion Islands and of the Onions uh, uh, as individuals with the history of the areas that experienced the revolution and the people who fought and faced the consequences of the war. I'm saying here that uh, I'm describing this as the, the history of the areas that experienced the revolution because the Ionians were not 
present only in the Peloponnese and in continental Greece in what we call Rumeli or Stereo Lava uh, recently and today. Ionian start to be found in the Black Sea, are fighting in uh, the um, army of uh, Alexander Sipsilandis in uh, the Danube. They are situated in Smyrna and Istanbul. Some of them uh, suffered the massacres that follow, that follow the outbreak of the revolution. The Ionians are a diaspora in their own. They are potentially, if we consider that part of the Greek diaspora, but they form uh, their own diaspora, many of them uh, present at the time in Russia or Russian uh, territories. And the three factors specifically that uh, entangled the history of the Ionian Islands with the revolution are the first, the obvious, but I think needs to be historically explained and historicized, uh, the geographical proximity uh, of the islands. And I will refer to that uh, later on with by looking at the map uh, as well. The second is the imperial uh, European rule of the Ionian Islands that for uh, at least 20 years uh, brought uh, this part of uh, the Greek world into direct contact and overlap with uh, European imperial uh, aspirations, armies, individuals, and state projects. And the third one is, again, uh, quite obvious, but I think it needs to be explained and historicized, the war itself, the dynamic of the revolution, that because of the first uh, two points, uh, brought the history of the Ionian Islands in a much uh, more um, direct way into contact with that of the revolution, although this is not always acknowledged. And uh, the, this geographical proximity is uh, seen here. This is part of a uh, projected on, a, on the present day map of the 1850 uh, map that clearly uh, distinguishes, as contemporaries did, of course, people at the, at the time, between Greece that had been formed since 1830 and its uh, borders agreed uh, here, uh, including the Cycladis Islands and Esporadas, and the Ionian Republic, uh, including the island of Kithira uh, further south. This is uh, a distinction that uh, makes us think uh, in many ways that there were several state projects being entertained, created uh, the result of war, uh, in fact, at the time. And the Greek state kingdom uh, after 1832 was uh, one of them. In more than one ways, in more than a geographical way, however, it is well known that the Ionian Islands, because of the Venetian, medieval, and onwards tradition, formed an intermediate or liminal uh, space uh, in relation to the, to the rest of the Greek world, let's say, under Ottoman rule. There has been uh, a work that uh, shows how the Ionian Islands, when uh, they were formed, they became uh, a Venetian territory. They, some people uh, have argued that they escaped, so to speak, the, uh, the, the tyranny of the Ottoman Empire, but I think this simplifies things a little bit uh, too much. They definitely experienced a different historical trajectory, different institutions, uh, but by the time they engaged uh, with uh, other uh, parts of Europe, such as the European empires, the French, the Russian, and the British, uh, there are three, four uh, distinctive characteristics uh, that in a way uh, prepare this uh, part of the Greek world for the revolution. The first is that uh, Rigas Feroz's radical uh, Republican message uh, gained considerable currency in the Ionian Islands since one of his um, associates, uh, Perevos, went uh, to uh, the islands and uh, they were uh, then one of the first uh, printing uh, presses was brought uh, to the islands that uh, also printed parts of uh, Rigas' uh, books and work. The, the former uh, Venetian uh, control also uh, meant that many Ionians had also fought uh, for their own purposes and serving the, the Venetian Empire had, had uh, fought for uh, decades and even for centuries before 1800 to the Venetian Ottoman Wars. So there was a tradition of some Ionians, despite, depending of course on class and their uh, contribution, would either fund uh, galleys uh, for the Venetian Navy or would participate uh, with, um, uh, with fighting forces uh, to the wars. But by the early 19th century, after the British uh, occupied uh, Zakynthos or uh, Zande, uh, they, they decided to form uh, what they call a Greek regiment. Uh, of Greek light infantry specifically. And one of the people that played a, a 
a great role in the revolution uh, afterwards was uh, the Irish um, uh, military man Richard uh, Church. This is the man that Kolokotronis uh, was uh, trained under. Uh, you all recognize, uh, or most of you would uh, recognize the distinctive uh, helmet that um, Kolokotronis uh, was wearing. This is uh, precisely part of the uniform that you can see here, uh, Richard Church uh, proudly uh, wearing. But Kolokotronis is just one of many well-known uh, military leaders of the revolution of the future revolutionary war, as well as many fighters who uh, find refuge in the Ionian Islands uh, as uh, the conflict uh, of some of them with Ali Pasha, the other great uh, factor and catalyst of the Greek revolution is uh, shaping up in the early 19th century. And of course, many of them are the well-known Suliotes uh, following their uh, war with uh, Ali Pasha in beginning in 1802, then they reach a compromise and they finally decide uh, perhaps foolishly to fight uh, to his side when uh, the Sultan sends his army to uh, force him into uh, to obey him uh, or uh, to kill him. The other group uh, that uh, finds refuge in the Ionian Islands, also from uh, Epirus, the uh, continent uh, across the Straits of Corfu, are uh, the people of Parga. Uh, Parga was uh, sold or um, granted, uh, ceded, as the term of the time had it, to Ali Pasha and the Ottoman Empire more broadly in 1819. And the fortunes of the uh, Parga residents, for most of them at least, were since then uh, tied to Corfu, where most of them uh, moved. But many clefts uh, from the Peloponnese, one of them was Kolokotronis, found refuge in Zakynthos, in Zande and, the Onia, and some other Ionian islands, when they were forced to leave uh, from the Peloponnese in uh, the period when uh, there was um, a... a an attempt to clear uh, the area from, uh, from the violence, uh, to stop the violence that had uh, dominated the region. The other major uh, factor in which the Ionian Islands played a role was uh, the formation of the Filiketeria, uh, the friendly society, the organization uh, that prepared uh, the war in many ways, uh, was uh, based in uh, Zakynthos, headed by Count uh, Roma, one of the aristocrats, uh, one of the important families and representatives of families in the island, uh, who um, introduced to the secret society, the secret organization, uh, several of the people who found refuge uh, in uh, the island of Zakynthos or the island of Lefkada and, um, and many locals, of course. So this is part of the preparation for the uprising that uh, was by 1820 was no secret anymore. Uh, the question was when uh, Greeks were going to strike and where. And Aeonians played uh, a role in uh, both of these, uh, in these developments. The other way in which um, one has to think about the Aeonian Islands as uh, a catalyst for the Greek Revolution is that they form one of the preferred uh, or imagined state projects in the region. One of the most well-known, uh, recently at least, uh, projects is uh, the unsuccessful proposal in 1808 by Muslim and Christian notables of the Peloponnese to offer uh, the, their region, the Peloponnese, the Moria, uh, to seed it, to seed from the Ottoman Empire and uh, offer it to uh, Napoleon as a French protectorate on the Ionian uh, Islands model. Uh, this is uh, obviously a plan that never came to fruition, uh, what's interesting, though, is that they are calling uh, themselves the Peloponnesian Confederates. And in this plan, they seem to have imagined a much more locally controlled and autonomous, in many ways, cross-confessional uh, distribution of power and articulated in a language of emancipation from oppression and tyranny. As you can uh, imagine, only the last part of this uh, statement, of this scheme, uh, was realized following the Greek uh, war of independence. Uh, the state that comes out of it is not only of the Peloponnese, so it's not uh, just the, the region of the Peloponnese. It is not cross-confessional uh, and uh, does not include any distribution of power. It becomes uh, a Christian-only uh, nation, of course. But the Onion Islands, as uh, they became a state, uh, the United States of the Onion Islands after 1815, with a constitution that was uh, approved by the, and designed in many ways by the first uh, 
uh, High Commissioner, the governor of the islands, and was approved by the King of England or the Great Britain, also provided uh, some, um, uh, some imagination of what a Greek state could look like. However, I think uh, some historians have argued this for a while. I think uh, the more I read about this uh, case, uh, the less convinced I am that this was considered as an alternative, uh, as a real alternative, and it was there as a model to follow once the revolution broke out, because if you take, for instance, the foundational documents, the constitutions of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of 1822 uh, and following, uh, following once, uh, or the local uh, political constitutions of Eastern uh, uh, continental Greece, for example, there is no reference to the Constitution of 1817 uh, uh, of the Onion Islands. This shows that by then they had, were developing their own uh, state projects responding in many ways to the revolution, uh, revolutionary process. The outcome of British intervention uh, and entanglement uh, with the Greek Revolution also uh, has uh, at least uh, four dimensions uh, that are not uh, so uh, commonly uh, mentioned in discussions about the role of Ionian Islands in the revolution. The first is the protection. Uh, so there's a sort of real humanitarian aspect and story of this, the protection of refugees from the Peloponnese and especially Rumeli, and the neutrality or de facto recognition of Greeks as beleaguered people that it was, um, that uh, occurred, happened in 1823 by the British. And this is important because, uh, both because the Ionian Islands as a space very close to the, revo the Revolutionary War, uh, the battle zone saved lives, uh, but also uh, because it meant that the recognition of Greeks as beleaguered people meant that Greek ships were not considered as piratical any longer. And this, is a, this was a, an important uh, advantage. The second aspect is the arrival of the first loans to the provisional government in 1824 and uh, 25, uh, because uh, this is what the revolutionaries decide, uh, de realize that they need from very early on. So the first uh, loans arrived uh, not just uh, with the sanction and uh, the um, uh, aid, the assistance of Lord Byron, uh, we'll talk about in a minute, but also uh, by being um, uh, allowed to, uh, to pay the uh, revolutionary government with uh, funds that were found in the Onion Islands. Uh, the, um, the other aspect of uh, British intervention is the formation gradually as part of the first two results of the um, uh, uh, de facto recognition of Greeks and the greater involvement of Britain in the war, the formation of a pro-British uh, function among the revolutionaries. And this was followed by the deeper involvement in the resolution of Greek affair, uh, which was a result not just of British, but also Russian uh, involvement. One of the people that uh, is uh, commonly associated uh, not with uh, Britain or even the Onion Islands is uh, Ioannis Kapodistria. Uh, Kapodistria was uh, the, um, the first governor, uh, but here he is seen uh, at a young age, uh, probably soon after, uh, while during he was in uh, Corfu, after he came uh, back from his uh, studies, uh, and where he actually learned uh, the art of uh, politics. Uh, by serving as one of the most important and one of the top ministers in the Septinsular uh, Republic. So among his first um, uh, political experience uh, uh, actions was to broker a uh, deal between the uh, rival factions in the island of Kifalonia in 1802, uh, which was not just uh, killing uh, many uh, villagers who were following the two families, but were also tearing the fledgling, um, the nascent uh, Septimsula Republic as well. Uh, there were calls at the time reports about Kefalonia uh, being um, uh, ravaged by civil war, as they call it, by the island of Zande wanting to secede from the uh, Septimsula Republic. So this unity of the Onion Islands that we come to understand later in the 19th century is by no means a given in the early part of the century and other republic. Kapodistas was initially enthusiastic about British rule and its liberal um, uh, characteristics. He thought that the protectorate of the Onion Islands was uh, probably one of the best uh, 
um, arrangements that could be made uh, in the Treaty of Paris. Uh, and he was right, uh, not so in the um, uh, future trajectory of the Onion Islands, uh, but and their not so liberal uh, character of uh, rule uh, that was very oppressive actually to uh, the Onions for decades. Uh, but he was right about the islands not granted to the Habsburg Empire, because we can only assume, of course, and history is not written with ifs, but with whys, you know, why something happened, uh, and not uh, what uh, would have happened if something else had taken place. But we can probably safely uh, assume that uh, a Habsburg dominated Iron and Islands would have been a lot more hostile to any Greeks from the Onion Islands participating to the war or even sending troops to uh, the Peloponnese and the uh, Rumeli, in fact, aiding in assistance to the Ottoman troops. That's, that's after all what they did in the Italian peninsula when um, there were rebellions that broke out. So Kapodistrias, let's go back to what actually happened. Kapodistrias' enthusiasm about British rule was followed by skepticism and reaction in writing and several times the last time he went to Corfu was in 1819, uh, when uh, he realizes that this is by far uh, not a liberal uh, regime at all. When the revolution breaks out, as uh, Thanos Veremis uh, has written, he becomes effectively the secret uh, leader of the Greek revolution or a leader in disguise, let's say. Uh, he does not uh, disguise his uh, views about it, but he does not actively uh, go to Greece, let's say, or he does fundraise, though, he writes to everyone he knows about the revolution, he gets in touch with his friend, uh, Einard, uh, the Swiss uh, merchant banker, who would later uh, also uh, provide uh, some of the loans to the revolution. But when in, uh, he's also important, because when in 1825, uh, following the civil wars of the, among between the revolutionaries and the invasion of the Peloponnese by Ibrahim and his Egyptian trained army, he refused to support the project of Greece becoming autonomous and under British uh, protection in the Onion Islands uh, model again, which is known as the act of uh, submission. So he um, refused to support a project that uh, Greeks, many Greeks, many Greeks among the revolutionary government had signed uh, whether pro-British or not, and his election to presidency in July 1827 in uh, Trezina uh, divided revolution uh, leaders, especially those from uh, Idra and Spetses, who abstained from electing him and left. Something, of course, that did not bode well at all for the future um, opposition that especially the island of Idra and Spetses and, and some other uh, circles and other factions developed against uh, Kapodistria. One of the major contributions, and rightly so, I think, of uh, Ionians was to fight in the revolution itself. Uh, but not only in the Morea and the uh, Rumeli, Ionians uh, were found fighting with Ypsilandis in present day Romania, where the first battle, where the first act of the, the first scene, uh, rather, of the first act of the uh, Greek revolution uh, was played out. Support of Ionians came in the form of money and provisions generally from Russia, so in, in Odessa, where many Greeks and Ionians among them were uh, uh, resident and trading, uh, but also other ports of the Black Sea. The Ionians were um, a large enough number to form a regiment, uh, mostly from Zykynthos uh, and Kefalonia, but in some cases they were joined by, uh, by others too. Uh, there were some Ionians who immediately jumped to uh, the revolution when it breaks out in Patra, for instance, in March uh, 1821, and they participate to the blockading of the, to the siege of the Ottomans in the uh, castle of Patras uh, in that, on that month uh, since the outbreak of the revolution, something that lasted for years. Uh, Patras was never uh, taken by uh, the Greek Revolutionary Army. It is estimated that uh, 275 Ionians fought in Valachia in, with the Psylandis, and about 100 of them reached the Peloponnese and continued uh, fighting. The flight of uh, Parganiotes and Suliotes to fight in Epirus and Akananea in Western Greece it also is to be credited uh, to the Onion Islands partly because they had found refuge in those regions and they could easily cross um, across the sea uh, to uh, fight for their lands in many ways. 
One of the most famous uh, Ionians and sort of in a leading position was Andreas Metaxas from Kefalonia, from the well-known Metaxas family, that was not just a fighter and leader, uh, but also a future politician of the Greek state. He became uh, prime minister in the very critical period between the uprising of the Athens uh, garrison against King Otto in September 1843 and the granting and the signing of the constitution uh, by the first parliament in 1844. As I mentioned earlier, some of the um, important issues to remember in this entangled history of the Ionian Islands and the Greek Revolution is the arrival of the first loans uh, to the provisional government because they came mostly from Britain. So there's a very direct uh, involvement of British uh, leverage, let's call it broadly speaking, uh, and in the revolution. This is partly a philhellenic uh, act. Uh, there was uh, important gains to be made from such a loan and uh, investors, uh, let's call them in national projects at the time, they're not lending money only to Greece. They are engaging in similar projects or schemes in South America, uh, which experiences its own uh, revolutionary um, nationalist wars. But the case of Greece is particularly important because it really ties financially as well uh, the revolutionary government provision at the time uh, to uh, the British um, influence and uh, control. These are uh, three of the, the three people who uh, negotiated the loans with the London Greek Committee and um, British merchant bankers in London, Ioannis Orlandos, Andreas Aimis, and um, Andreas Luriotis, whose portrait I could not find. That's why this is, there's, there's, a, there's a blank uh, area there. Uh, uh, Orlandos came from uh, Spetses, uh, Zaimis from uh, uh, Achaia, from the region of Achaia. He's a well-known uh, uh, notable and one of the key uh, um, players in the formation of the Achaian assembly from the beginning of the revolution, an important uh, politician together the, and the rest of his family too. Um, the uh, ways in which the loans um, uh, were arrived in Greece is also very crucial because uh, they were cashed in uh, the Onion Islands. The Zante, Zakynthos at the time, was the only place that uh, significant amounts of cash could be found uh, because, there's, as you can imagine, there's no bank at the time. There is only the practice of um, um, bills of payment and um, the promise of, of paying that uh, current exporters and merchant bankers, uh, Barf and Logothetopoulos specifically, could um, negotiate and uh, finance in, in, based in Zakynthos. One of the most well-known individuals in this sort of story of connections between uh, Britain and the Islands and the revolution, of course, uh, Lord uh, Byron. Uh, who uh, arrives in uh, uh, Kefalonia in 1823, stays there for five months uh, and contemplating uh, to which faction of the Greek uh, revolution he will decide. He's probably decided, but he is waiting uh, um, um, anxiously for information from uh, the two factions of the, at least two at the time by then uh, of the revolution. And he decides not surprisingly to support uh, Mavrokordatos here to his uh, right. He also he arrives in Missolonghi uh, in 1824, and sadly, only after uh, a couple of months, he dies. Uh, and uh, by then, of course, Byron is not the romantic uh, poet of the early uh, 19th uh, century in the 1810s uh, with uh, with Shelley, uh, but he's uh, Byron, the pragmatist, the campaigner for financing and supporting politically, also of course, uh, the Greek Revolution. And we have every indication that had Byron lived he would have played a significant role probably in uh, Greek politics of the revolution until its end and of the Greek state, um, assuming that, of course, it went uh, to, it was, uh, the revolution succeeded as it did. So one of the things uh, that uh, Byron does is, of course, to publicize uh, the revolution, but he also gets in touch while staying in um, Kefalonia with uh, Colonel J Charles James uh, Napier. His support, uh, financial, but also more broadly political, uh, led uh, to the emergence of uh, the liberal uh, political faction uh, of the revolution, uh, also known as modernizers sometimes. And by these, we include Polizoides, Glarakis, uh, Negris, who wrote the constitution of uh, Eastern continental Greece, uh, 
Trikoupis, uh, Spiridon Trikoupis and father of Harilaus Trikoupis, also Spiridon Trikoupis, one of the first authors of the history of the Greek Revolution, uh, Psyllas and Kundumis. So these are the some of them future uh, ministers and senior administrators in the Greek state. In um, in one of the, uh, the cases uh, that I think um, deserves our attention in this sort of entangled geographical, but also conceptual history of the Ion Analysis and the Greek Revolution is uh, the protection of refugees, uh, the, uh, the island in the island of Calamos, uh, islet really, it's a very small, uh, situated here, uh, very close to the coast of uh, Akarnania, but belonging to the Ionian state, the Ionian United States of the Ionian Islands, the British protectorate. This meant that the um, uh, people who uh, arrived in the uh, island of Calamos could here seen and the uh, coast of Karnania uh, across the strait uh, were granted protection, uh, were uh, protected from uh, the war, uh, from ships arriving to, uh, to kill them. This, uh, how, however, was not um, uh, the case in, uh, in uh, uh, some other parts of uh, of the Greek world. Uh, the a case of Kithira uh, and Zande, uh, for instance, the incidents in 1821, uh, also both islands in the Ionian Islands, uh, are uh, emblematic of this uh, policy uh, of the British uh, towards the Greek Revolution, which has been um, is suggested passed from non-intervention initially to neutrality, uh, and finally to intervention. Non-intervention meant an equally and openly probably hostile um, even attitude and um, respectively support of uh, the British for Ottoman ships. Uh, the cases of Kithra and Zande are in the early months of the revolution when two ships, uh, one uh, Algerian, the other full of uh, refugees arrived in Kithra and Zande respectively and uh, they were um, greeted in a very hostile manner by locals. Uh, they were fired upon and uh, the local British authorities sent troops to protect uh, the ships and the people, in which case the locals reacted uh, very hostile, uh, very aggressively against the British forces, killing in uh, uh, one or both uh, incidents, actually one or two of uh, the soldiers. This offered uh, the opportunity for High Commissioner Metland and his second in command uh, and future commissioner, uh, uh, Frederick Adam, to declare martial law in all the islands one by one, and finally and uh, disarm the entire uh, population uh, because this was seen as an issue of public order. Metland, however, beyond the, uh, this imposition of uh, draconian measures, he also gave aid to the distress of uh, both camps. Uh, the, uh, people who the Muslims who survived the attacks by uh, revolutionary Greeks on their uh, villages and also Greeks who uh, were escaping the wrath of uh, Ottoman uh, armies. So Calamus is really this you know very small island but emblematic of this sort of liminal space uh, between uh, the two uh, places. Um, also it has to be said that because sometimes especially historians of the Ionian Islands or historians in Greece tend to I think emphasize in, enormously the importance of uh, Ionians and the revolution. Uh, it is uh, equally important and interesting that the Ionians, many at least, continue trading with Ottoman uh, commanders during the war, doing business, that is, with uh, the fortresses that were under siege if they could, uh, or providing the uh, Ottoman armies with uh, provisions during the war. One comment I would like to make is also very briefly about the Ionian state during the war in the 1820s, because it allows this uh, comparison with what was happening in, uh, in war-torn uh, Greece, in the Peloponnese and the Rumeli. The Ionian islands as a space were, as you probably gathered, crucial for the transmission of news, uh, of goods, uh, and provisions for the war to both sides, uh, as they often relieved the Ottoman forces under siege. But there were also a liminal space where allegiances could be renegotiated and accommodated. The most well-known case, to some at least, is uh, Armatolos Varnakiotis, who started fighting with the revolutionaries. He did fight for a year or two. Uh, and then in 1822 was accused for switching to the Ottoman forces, which was, especially in that area of Rumeli, uh, of, uh, by, Armatolos, uh, by Armatoli, it was not in any case um, exceptional. It was 
commonly known as Kapakia, uh, those who switched. And he was substituted by Marcos Bocelis. He fled to the Ionian Islands and to Calamo specifically, and then Lefkada until 1827. And there's documents uh, in uh, the British National Archives that follow his, uh, uh, his behavior, let's say, and his uh, moves to see who, which part, his, which uh, side he's gonna end up uh, in. But there are other things that are going on in the Ionian Islands are pretty interesting and important too in the 1820s. This is uh, the palace uh, of St. Michael and St. George in Corfu, which was uh, built uh, in 1821. And in front of it, it's a statue by the, the first uh, governor, uh, High Commissioner Metlamp. And the, the, here is the first um, long-term uh, um, uh, commissioner and uh, governor of the islands of uh, Friedrich Adam. He is in, in this fountain because he is accredited for bringing uh, water supply to the city of Corfu, uh, one of the major, uh, one of the many major public works that were undertaken in the Onion Islands at the time, and not just the capital of the state, uh, Corfu. Uh, the, the same uh, individual, uh, after he became high commissioner, he was uh, following closely what he was what was happening in the continental uh, in the continent across the sea as can be seen in uh, hundreds of pages uh, that were sent every year uh, from 1824 until 1829 uh, being labeled as a uh, greek revolution uh, by uh, commissioner uh, frederick adam and what he does is he includes correspondence intercepted letters uh, that were uh, passing through uh, the onion islands since it was the easier the only possible way uh, perhaps for ships to go uh, and uh, stop uh, on their way to ports of Trieste, Venice, uh, Livorno, and further west of Marseille. And he also took an interest all the way to the end of the war about what was gonna happen, especially through the extensive correspondence with Mayer, the British consul in Preveza, because the issue of borders and of uh, wars had not been settled yet. Uh, let me say also um, a note about uh, Sir Charles James Napier, the governor of Kefalonia, who in 1820s uh, is also rebuilding, uh, is changing the, the face and the economy in many ways of, uh, of Kefalonia by constructing the extensive network of roads uh, that he wrote a book about as well, as well as the pub public projects of a market, courthouse, and um, a sort of multi-purpose building in Lixuri, uh, as well as in Argostoli, uh, unfortunately, none of those uh, buildings survived the destructive earthquake of 1953. So there's a completely different uh, situation in uh, the neighboring to the revolutionary and islands at the same time that the war is entering its sort of uh, more um, difficult phase for uh, the Greek uh, revolutionary army and government in the Onion islands, people are experiencing a sort of um, boom with public works. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, and I'm not going to go into many much detail of uh, of what happens, uh, of what produced uh, this table. This table is uh, the uh, booming also in Ionian state finances, uh, and both in terms of revenue, uh, seen here uh, that increased significantly during uh, the period of this uh, of the War of Independence, and also their their ability to spend. And civil and military is pretty obvious. Uh, it does not include, has to say, the military contribution of the Union state, so 25,000 pounds per year, but civil is especially, is primarily salaries. So it, both the state is doing extremely well uh, in terms of revenue that comes primarily from the uh, currents uh, that are exported from the islands of Zakethos and Gifalonia and the olive oil of Corfu, but primarily from currents, which are ex experiencing a boom in uh, export trade because there's no currents to export from uh, the Peloponnese. So there are real gains to be made by uh, this uh, revolutionary uh, war. However, uh, let me move very quickly to the other uh, aspect of the involvement uh, of Britain in the resolution of the, of the Greek affair as it was called at the time and what could be called the diplomatic uh, twist uh, of the Greek revolution and the well-known history of protocols uh, that includes, of course, the secret protocol of 1827 uh, between Britain and Russia that led to, and France, that led to the Navarino uh, battle. The secret in the sense that if the Sultan did not agree to the terms proposed for an autonomous Greece, then the, uh, the three powers would intervene. Uh, not with the three uh, commanders that you see here, but uh, 
the, uh, the French and Russian. The three men you see here, uh, Richard Church, Lord Cochrane, and Frank Abney Hastings, whose um, proposal, I'll start with Hastings, Hastings to create a fleet of modern warships, which will belong to the state, was really what uh, Cochrane took on as he um, became the major admiral uh, of the Greek fleet in an effort to unite, you know, the until then island-based navies of, uh, of the Greek uh, revolution. Richard Church, well known, he was, um, I introduced him to you earlier uh, in, the, in the talk. He's uh, the one who takes over the Greek uh, army and its, um, and its leadership. So uh, in many ways, this is a period when the Ionian, but not only the nation is a product of the revolution and empire uh, is a product of the revolution because it is, uh, Ionians are forced to respond in uh, either way uh, by participating or by uh, for being forced to remain uh, silent and not participate in the revolution because the measures of the, uh, of the British protectorate were draconian, you know, people could be tried and executed uh, or uh, imprisoned at best and their um, fortunes and their uh, wealth confiscated if they were uh, found supporting the, the Greek revolution. But they are moving from uh, serving, from being imperial subjects to from having an imperial allegiance uh, to a certain extent, uh, more or less, to having a national uh, consciousness. And that comes out of several empires, not just of the Ottoman, obviously, for the Greeks who lived uh, under Ottoman rule before the revolution, but also for Ionians who uh, continued to live after the revolution uh, until uh, 1864. So there is this transition from Ionian Greeks to Greek nationals that takes place gradually, and it starts in the 1810s, and I think it continues all the way to the 1860s, only after that is the Ionian Islands became uh, part of Greece, uh, which of course is part of a different uh, topic entirely. Uh, British involvement has also been called impossible neutrality. Um, I would say it is probably a, a shows a move from impossible neutrality to controlled uh, engagement, uh, because this is what uh, was considered uh, the best uh, approach for the British imperial um, leadership at the time to deal with uh, emerging uh, Greek uh, and quite um, um, ambitious uh, Greek nationalism. I would like to conclude by uh, talking about a less well-known um, Ionian, at least to most people, who uh, was also important for the early years of the Greek state. Um, it has been argued that uh, you know, they, there is this crisis of sovereignty in the 1820s around the world, um, both in the Atlantic, as uh, Jeremy Adelman has argued, and specifically the Mediterranean, as Maurizio Isabella uh, has argued uh, for a number of years now, that this crisis of sovereignty explains uh, to a large extent why there are uprisings uh, in Piemonte, in the Piedmont in North Italy, in Spain, in uh, the Peloponnese and in and the Ottoman Empire more broadly. But I think the case of Ionian Islands explains and the Ionians only to a certain extent the uprising uh, and this attack on monarchical authority uh, that includes uh, rebelling against the Ottoman Sultan. Um, Maurizio Isabella looks in particular in the case of Sicily and in the 1820s uh, Samos, which gained its autonomy in 1830s. But I think the Ionian Islands, one, if one looks more closely, uh, forms an exception because this crisis of sovereignty and against uh, even the monarchical uh, authority of the king, of the queen by then, uh, comes much later in the 1850s. In fact, as I argued earlier, many Ionians and the Ionian states benefited and in some cases profited from the war of independence, be it income from the current exports or the increased state revenue that came in. Uh, at the same time, of course, there were Ionians who fought for uh, the revolution. But if anything, uh, loyalty was being uh, reaffirmed during the 1820s and would be another decade before British rule was challenged by liberal politics in the very uh, convincing way by this man, Andreas uh, Mustoxidis, politician, historian. Um, he served uh, also in the first in the Capodistrias government, uh, one of the aides of Capodistrias, uh, who called him to organize the educational system of the new state, and he founded uh, the, the school uh, of Egina. Uh, he left um, Egina disappointed when uh, Capodistrias was assassinated. Uh, and he uh, went back to Corfu where he served the Onion State in that case, 
also from the critical standpoint of a liberal uh, intellectual. Uh, and at this point, I would like to conclude. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be glad to take any questions uh, or suggestions. Thank you all very much. Hello. Hey, uh, Saki, thank you very much for um, for a really interesting um, for a really interesting talk and. Um, for, um, in my mind, raising uh, myriad questions about uh, the, the intersection of uh, Ionian history and uh, mainland uh, Greek history, uh, but also, uh, as you pointed out, the whole uh, empire's uh, uh, question. Uh, as I uh, uh, wait for a few more uh, questions to, uh, to filter in, uh, I'll open up with a question of mine and then uh, uh, we'll move on, in fact, with two questions of mine that are kind of inspired from um, uh, modern parallels. Uh, and they might seem far off, but maybe they're useful for, uh, for our conversation. The first is, uh, do we know of how the Ottomans themselves looked at the Ionians? And uh, because I'm thinking of, you know, how Taiwan is looked by mainland China as a possible springboard for intervention in mainland China, of, of course, this, this history behind all that stuff, would the Ottomans have looked at the Ionians as this dangerous place that uh, other empires can use as an uh, opportunity to, uh, to spring open uh, Pandora's box in, the, in their realm? And the second is, uh, uh, has to do with refugees uh, uh, question that you raised. I mean, in, uh, in the modern era, uh, uh, let's say the Greek islands in the Aegean who receive uh, refugees also become media centers and become the places where the first interviews about uh, stories, uh, uh, about what is happening both in the passage, but also the things that spurred the passage uh, are collected and disseminated in the Western media. Do we have stories of that in the Ionian Islands where uh, people writing for, let's say, newspapers in, uh, in London are collecting stories locally to then create uh, a narrative uh, in, uh, in London? Dimitri, thank you very much for both uh, uh, excellent questions. Uh, and uh, they give me an opportunity to add to what I just said uh, by clarifying, hopefully. The Ottomans have um, a particular policy uh, on the Ionian Islands, uh, which we know about at least more uh, clearly uh, since 1800 and their uh, alliance with the Russians. So the formation of the Septinsula Republic is a Russian uh, Ottoman uh, initiative that is actually modeled on the merchant uh, medieval state of uh, Ragusa, Dubrovnik. So the idea is that they're gonna create a state that will allow both Russians and Ottoman interests at the time uh, and will serve both the, the states. And, but it's mostly run by Russians. So the, the Ionian, the Septimsula Republic has to pay tribute to uh, the uh, Ottomans uh, but it's run by the Russians. So the Russians, let's say, collect the money in practice. That's what it means in practice. Uh, the Septuagint Republic representatives had to go to Constantinople and get uh, the approval of the Sultan uh, before they go back to uh, their islands and um, allow the and uh, be able to uh, operate as a, as a state. So there are plans that emerging around 1800, but once you have the rise of Ali Pasha in the region, all this Ottoman policy, let's say, is filtered through his own ambitions. And we know about the man that his ambitions were, you know, very, quite large indeed. So he negotiates directly first with the French, then with the British after they arrive in the region. And he designs, in many ways, his own foreign policy, uh, which is interesting because, you know, it's, you know, territorially that that's what makes sense. Uh, so, but once the uh, Ottoman... Um, once the, the, salt, the Sultan realizes that Ali Pasha is a threat, I think his attentions are uh, turned to Ali Pasha and that's why he's sending an army to him to the extent that he actually takes um, troops from the Peloponnese as well, which gives an opportunity for um, uh, the rebels to, you know, for the Greeks to rebel in the Peloponnese. I think other than that, there are, um, the once the uh, Ionians from, Let's say the Peloponnese in 1806, when the, this uh, purge of the clefts, as it's known, uh, it's sort of an attempt to impose, to reimpose public order. Uh, 
in the Peloponnese. Um, once people fled to the Ionian Islands, run by the French and soon by the British, the they, the Ottomans kind of leave them to to that. They don't go after them because they because they don't really want to upset any uh, relations with the French and British. So the policy is to some extent uh, dictated by what happens in the region itself. I would say um, the refugees question is also uh, great uh, because uh, there's no you know Twitter and photography at the time, obviously. But there are reports about refugees, and in fact, they by refugees from both camps, you know, by you know for Muslim uh, refugees, but also for Christians who, as the uh, time goes by, of course, they are, and especially after Ibrahim's invasion, they are enslaved and in many cases brought back to uh, sent back to Egypt. So uh, they are sent to Egypt. So the islet of Calamus and this sort of space in between between the Ionian Islands and uh, the, the battle zone becomes well known because of the refugees. And uh, the reports actually built into introducing this humanitarian intervention aspect to the diplomatic solution that the British and the Russians and the French eventually are seeking. So yes, it played a role. Oh, th thank you so much. This is, this is really interesting. I, uh, years ago, um, uh, a student of Andres, uh, Julian Brooks defended a thesis on uh, uh, peacekeeping in the Macedonian era, which comes uh, some 80 years later. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting to see uh, the broader Greek world, if you want, becoming a space where notions that are very current to us uh, today, uh, peacekeeping, management of uh, beleaguered populations and so on, can actually start developing and uh, acquire what eventually becomes institutional, uh, institutionalized na nature. Uh, let, I'd like to shift to two questions by uh, Thodoros uh, Tolias. Uh, the first is, uh, what do we know about the Ionians who continued trading with the Ottomans in the 1820s? How was that activity seen by the general Ionian population? And uh, the second uh, is, uh, in your opinion, what was the single most important impact of the Ionians on the Greek uh, revolution? Uh, thank you both. Uh, thank you to, for both questions, uh, Thodoris. The, there is not exactly a, a Neonian public sphere yet in the 1820s, so that we know uh, to know, for example, uh, what did other Ionians think. This would come much later, about 20 years later, when you, fair, you have uh, free press in the islands. And to, free press was allowed to a certain extent because those newspapers who uh, went uh, over uh, the accepted limit, they were shut down and their editors sent to exile in very, very small Ionian islands. So there is not exactly a public sphere that uh, would allow us to you know, know what other Ionians uh, thought. Um, I would I would dare to uh, imagine that uh, they were probably seen as something, it was probably seen as something acceptable uh, uh, because throughout the period, it was uh, something common, especially after 1823, for both Greek ships and um, uh, Ottoman ships to seek refuge, you know, if they went, uh, if they ran aground, uh, or in the case of uh, Hastings that I showed you earlier, his uh, portrait, uh, he was badly injured uh, fighting with church around Mesolonghi, trying to recapture Mesolonghi, and he was taken to Zakynthos and died there, you know, as they were seeking some sort of more, uh, some better medical attention for him. So the area, the region is so close that it's actually absolutely involved in almost the daily life of the revolution. The, the single most important um, development uh, or um, aspect, uh, I would probably say the, the fact that uh, many onions uh, were uh, contributed to uh, the revolution from uh, Kapodistrias who formed his uh, political um, uh, imagination and his political practice for the first time in the Ionian Republic, uh, but also to uh, people like Metaxas and uh, a few other uh, Ionians, but also the role of Byron, you know, who really has his base in Kefalonia in 1823. So the, the, again, the geographical, but also political proximity uh, on role is, is really important. I have a question from uh, Alex uh, Jovanovic. Uh, who goes, uh, thank you for uh, uh, the rich talk. You've mentioned that the Ionian Islands served as a catalyst for the Greek Revolution. In regards to exposure to European educational practices, 
excuse me, European educational practices in the likes of Capodistria. The Ionians precede the Greek state in the subsequent Tanzimat educational remodeling of the Ottoman Empire. Could you speak to the role that European styled education, stressing the Hellenic identity and classical culture, among other things, available on the islands, uh, served as a model for the future Greek state's perception of itself and its inhabitants? And perhaps even the role of Ottomanism in Tanzimat era uh, Ottoman Empire? Uh, thank you. This is uh, also a great question. Uh, in fact, that's what I meant uh, precisely when I said that the imagination of uh, Europeans, but also Phaeonians themselves, begins to form towards a modern Greek identity that is based on uh, classical ideals. So when the French arrive in uh, Corfu, for instance, the, bishops, the bishop there gives to the French commander a copy of uh, Odyssey. And he says, you know, this is, and the response is uh, equivalent, you know, they call them Hellenes. So they don't call them, uh, you know, Greeks uh, or uh, Romney uh, or uh, something that would be most familiar to those Greeks of the Ottoman Empire. This is the first space where this, uh, it, it is often called that, it's often argued that, you know, Europeans imagined a cultural national identity for Greeks and the Greeks sort of adopted it. I think it's a little bit more, uh, complex than that, that Greeks themselves, but especially from the Ionian Islands, participate to this uh, ideal. But then you have uh, Lord Guilford and the Ionian Academy, the first Greek university often called in 1823-24, when he, uh, be, he follows uh, ancient Greek educational ideals, Athenian uh, more specifically, to the actual dress of people. So they're, they dress in tunics and they go around Corfu and and many people probably laugh at them, but it is telling of how uh, much they involved they are in this recreating this classical ideal. But then this happens in Corfu, sort of very fairly close to where the revolution uh, war is uh, raging, but it does not uh, speak to it. Uh, so I think uh, just like many classicists in the in European capitals and in the states, did not see themselves as supporting the Greek revolution and the Greek nation because they. Um, had this uh, love for the classical world. Similarly, many people in the Ionian Islands, uh, not many, but especially uh, those in Corfu perhaps, uh, did not see the two as, um, as overlapping, not yet perhaps. So what I mean is that the Ionian Islands uh, states develops its educational uh, policy by 1840s, Mustoxidis, again, he's designing uh, the, the policy. Uh, but it is independent of what is going on in Greece because they are different states. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, James Horncastle asks, uh, how many refugees uh, arrived in Palamos, if we have information? And uh, uh, if uh, the number was significant, how did the British go about provisioning them? I think there's one estimate that talks about 5,000 for the whole period. So there's, it, they, it comes and goes in waves. Uh, there are, uh, there's some information about 5,000 people, uh, which is quite a lot for a small uh, island. I think it also uh, refers to uh, people who cross to Lefkada in, in some cases. Uh, and uh, the provision was, the response was pretty uh, quick. So there is Generally, the Ionian state in the 1820s uh, responds to these humanitarian crises, whether uh, people who arrive from war on um, uh, continental Greece or from an earthquake, uh, they, they respond fairly quickly. Uh, and that is because they have the means to do so. Uh, so there's a sort of po social policy that uh, is in uh, place there. Uh, but the, the number is very difficult to uh, estimate. There is, an, there is an estimate for about 5,000. Uh, but it's probably it's probably less. Um, it also, as I said, came uh, in waves too. A question about uh, either and Spetses uh, and maybe a clarification on why they're uh, opposed to the presidency of uh, to the leadership of Capodistria. Well, uh, there's several reasons. Uh, the main one I would say is that he was. Uh, he was considered a, a Russian, uh, a man of, uh, of Russians, uh, of the Russian uh, emperor. So the fact that he tried uh, to distance himself from Russian policy and intervention was not always the case. And it didn't help him that when things uh, turned really ugly in the summer of 1831, uh, when uh, Miaoulis um, set fire to two of the uh, ships of the Greek fleet in Poros, uh, 
he called for uh, the Russian admiral to crush the rebellion, which he did. Uh, so, but then, of course, after less than two months, he was Kakodistias was assassinated. So the reaction of uh, Idra and Spetses uh, also, but especially Idra ship owners and leadership uh, was uh, because they saw uh, their interests not uh, fulfilled, let's say, under a governorship of Kapodistrias. And that's why they didn't vote for him. And they continued uh, pressing him in uh, getting compensation for their participation to the war. So when I'm saying that, you know, the Ionians or Ionian shipping and current uh, exporters and the Ionian state revenue benefited, there's also a loss that um, Idra or Spetses uh, or Galaxy the, or Misolongi ships uh, and ship owners suffered because they turned very quickly their ships from uh, trading ships to warships. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, another question is um, a bit of a clarification on uh, uh, what we mean by the revenue of the Ionian Islands uh, was based on the export of, uh, of currents. Um, uh, what are we talking about when we're when, when we're saying about it? Do we have percentages? Um... It's it's very large. It's uh, it ranges some years. It ranges up to sixty percent. Uh, so there are especially towards the you know the, the years of the revolution that there was no exports from uh, Patra uh, usually. So what it means is that uh, there's at the time there's only indirect uh, taxation, of course. So all the revenues come from the very high uh, export tax that uh, the British state has uh, imposed on uh, exports as well as imports. So usually not imports of British goods. You know they're very they have a very preferential. Uh, uh, tariff policy for British imports, understandably, uh, but the exports um, uh, duty is very, very high. So, but the revenues come uh, uh, from that. So effectively, the producers uh, were subsidizing the revenue uh, of, uh, of the state because they are burdened in the end by the very high uh, tax. It was about 18.5% um, uh, so per unit. So there is, this, is, uh, this is how the Ionian state and most states actually got its revenue from customs. Uh, I, I would like to ask a clarification point. I, don't, I hope it's not nitpicky, but uh, it's about uh, how that uh, uh, tax kind of burden gets uh, felt on the ground. Uh, would that be something that an individual producer feel as a tax or a tax that would be collected at the exit point where the aggregators of all the production and export uh, merchants uh, would have to pay? Uh. At several stages. First of all, the Ionians were, who produce currents, they are bound by the relations of production and marketing that are um, closer, very close to what E.P. Thompson used to call the moral economy. So you are tied to a, a landowner uh, for which you may cultivate his land, but the, uh, the vineyard belongs to, to you because you have planted it, for example. Uh, but then you can only take uh, your currants once, once they are dry to uh, the landowners, one of the few landowners, in some cases merchants, uh, uh, storehouse until they get exported, in some cases several months later or weeks. Usually exports um, peak at September, October, uh, but they can also continue until November or December. Uh, but in order to do that, they have to store them. So uh, producers were paying a fee, sometimes significant, for the storage of currents. And uh, then uh, this is how the, and the calculation of the amount stored was not fair at all. So, uh, but it, the producers did not have much of a choice. They do not have their uh, own storage facilities, let's say. Uh, so they are, um, Controlled in in that at that part of the process, let's say by producers, by the uh, by the exporters and uh, storehouse uh, owners, and then the exporters also uh, have to pay uh, the amount uh, needed for for the export before uh, the uh, so that they, it compensates for the high import uh, tax in Britain as well. So effectively, the product is taxed uh, twice. And it's true that some Ionian islands governors ask repeatedly for uh, the currents to export import in uh, Britain, the duty, to be reduced. 
uh, but uh, by then, uh, the Greek state's uh, currents are back on the market. And uh, in fact, the, the same, uh, in many cases, the same merchants who export currents from Zykethos or Kefalonia export them from Patra uh, or later Katakolo as well. So there is a, a network that is formed that has also banking uh, operations uh, that was not, um, that did not include the, the producers, let's say. Thank you. A uh, bit of a switch of, uh, of theme, but uh, an important question, I think, from my colleague, uh, David Mirhadi. Uh, can you say something about the role of uh, uh, the church? One hears that the Ionians, from their Venetian experience, had uh, more of a Roman church, or uh, they had also been under uh, most of the islands, non-Ottoman rule. Uh, what do we, what can That's we say true. about the church? Uh, the, the church in the Ionian islands is uh, run uh, as... Uh, it, there is a, a, a Roman Catholic presence, but by 1800, it is um, extremely small. Uh, so most, let's say, Venetian soldiers or uh, uh, Venetian families had, has, have converted, have been um, integrated with the Greek Orthodox uh, elite po population and, and families. And there is an inflow of uh, uh, Roman Catholics, but not until... 18, 19, 20, when the first uh, Maltese who uh, come to uh, help build the palace in Corfu that I showed you earlier, uh, settled in Corfu. Uh, or later, uh, there is a attempt to form an agricultural colony in Kefalonia and about 250 Maltese arrive. Um, that project failed, but most Maltese stayed or went to Corfu as well. So there is an inflow of Maltese and other uh, Roman Catholics in the during the British uh, protectorate, but that um, is a small that has a small presence. The role of the church, um, I don't remember at the moment, uh, this moment, what exactly the church in the Onion Islands did, but I I think it did not do something spectacularly different from the patriarch uh, who they were uh, accountable to, the patriarch in Constantinople which of course condemned uh, the revolution for, for, the, for the various reasons that uh, he did. And of course, this did not save uh, his life or another six or 70 bishops um, during the 1821 massacres. Uh, so the church had, uh, had a role to play. And um, I think it also served in the cases of Count Roma, for instance, Zykenthos. Uh, it is well known, speaking of Roman Catholics, the one of the Roman Catholic uh, church in Zykethos was used, I think Agios Georgios, St. George, it was used as a meeting uh, place, as a sort of a secretive meeting place for uh, the Filikieteria, the Friendly Society organization that was preparing a revolution. And Count Roma was the sort of leader of, uh, of that branch. Uh, onwards, uh, uh, George Vardas uh, asks, uh, uh, first says, brilliant presentation, Sakis. Uh, to what extent did the Ionian Islands facilitate the dissemination of uh, the ideas and inspiration offered by the Enlightenment uh, uh, to the revolutionary population and forces in mainland Greece? Um, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I think the revolutionary, the Enlightenment ideas uh, concern people like Vienius Vulgaris, who came from Corfu, for example, uh, and he had a brilliant career before the revolution. Um, it does not, I think, affect uh, the people who are fighting the war. Uh, there is often an association, um, a, a sort of easy to or too direct connection between the French Revolution and uh, the, um, uh, the ideals of the Enlightenment that, that are more sort of radical, let's say, against uh, monarchical authoritarian rule and the outbreak of the Greek Revolution. I think that's true to an extent. But once the revolution breaks out, whether it's Ionians from the Southern Ionian Islands who want to, to support uh, the, the Greek war, uh, or uh, people from Parga and the Suliotas who go back in many ways to fight for uh, their land primarily, and only gradually become integrated to the Greek uh, uh, revolutionary forces, the Greek army, uh, it is um, important to keep in mind that people have different motives. And because it's a very disparate group, you know, they're fighting a war at many fronts. Uh, they are divided by intense factions that some of them reflect British, French, or Russian uh, interest in the region. But in the end, uh, the, 
one could say that because every revolution is followed by civil war, uh, or you know, in many cases, every revolution is a civil war, one could say, uh, as well as a sort of has a common enemy. Uh, I think Ionians uh, and the Enlightenment ideas are filtered in many different ways. And by, what, by this, I mean, what does liberty you know, uh, or fraternity mean uh, to people who are fighting uh, in the Peloponnese at the time? When Kolokotronis was in Zakynthos, he left the island only once in 15 years before going in 1821 to Peloponnese. He left only once to fight, uh, to support, I think it was in 1816, to support an Albanian Muslim um, uh, cleft, a brigand like him, because he was tied by blood to him uh, and family relations. So here's Kolokotron is a future uh, leader of the, of the Greek revolution who risks his life essentially to, uh, to fight for an Albanian Muslim. And this tells us that you know, fraternity at the time means something entirely different. Uh, it's more like brotherhood, uh, but it has a completely different meaning than it has in uh, the French revolutionary context. Uh, but soon enough, it would be impossible for Kolokotronis, who is Adelfopitos or um, blood-related uh, uh, brotherhood, to, uh, to have a, a, such a relation, unless they were uh, soldiers who had to be uh, who, had he, who, who he had to negotiate with, just like he did with the Albanian fighters of Tripoli in, in a, within a few years, in 1821. Yeah, I, I suspect then that um, uh, similar realignments would have happened with the people who were ready to have a confederation of Muslim and Christians under the French, uh, and then eventually slaughtered one another as uh, the chips fell during the revolution, probably. Huh? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we're staying with the uh, development of a national identity uh, theme that we've been discussing. Uh, and I have a question from uh, Stefan Bozanic on uh, uh, how the British uh, sitting on their observation post on the Ionian Islands perceive this development of, uh, of, uh, of an identity among the revolution, uh, the rebelled populations. How they see it, where do they see it go? Do they understand it? Uh, thank you. I think they do. And in fact, they are so concerned about a potential uprising in the Onion Islands that, uh, as I briefly mentioned, maybe I should have uh, dwelled more on it, they very quickly disarm the population. And these are firearms we're talking about. They don't um, uh, take out of, uh, of uh, uh, gun uh, ownership um, the, uh, the knives that every, every man probably at the time carries. They are, we're talking about firearms that are being uh, uh, taken out of uh, ownership. So the British are concerned about this sort of patriotism, I would call it, that emerges at the time. And this uh, support that many, uh, in various ways, some Ionians demonstrate for the Greek revolution. And they do understand it very well, uh, but they are, um, also have uh, a very uh, specific frame of mind, I think. That is the British Mediterranean as part of the imperial uh, space that Governor Metland himself uh, is responsible for. He's a man who has been to uh, Ceylon or Sri Lanka uh, as governor. He was in uh, the island of San Domingue during the revolution, the Haitian revolution. And his experience is uh, shaped. And of course, in Malta, in uh, uh, 1814 onwards as commander of the British Mediterranean forces. So their policy is not, that's what I am saying uh, primarily, that is not shaped by Ionian interests or developments or the Greek revolution only, but they always keep in mind a larger um, landscape. And uh, that includes, of course, the Ottoman Empire for the reason why they are not supporting uh, the Greek war from, at the beginning. And of course, you know, I don't need to remind, remind you that all uh, powers at the time are opposed to any revolutions and any uh, national, especially social or liberal, as they're called, uh, movements, you know. Even though the Greeks uh, very quickly develop and uh, sign and produce to the world, present to the world a constitution, they're very clear to say that this is a national and especially religious war, so that they gain uh, the support of the British in the sort of tireless efforts of the London Greek Committee of Byron and others, of course, 
uh, but also they gathered in that more international support from elsewhere as well. So the British, yes, they do understand this formation of national identity, but they think they can keep it under check in the Onion Islands by introducing very strict measures. In 1819, for instance, I'm going to stop at that, they really crush a rebellion in uh, the island of Lefkada. And they were talking about brutal uh, response. So as you probably know, they're not shy as elsewhere in the empire to, to demonstrate you know, brutality that of course we wouldn't associate with a liberal regime, but of course, you know, liberalism and liberal uh, measures can also be very cruel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I have to say your reference to, say, to Sri Lanka is interesting to me because uh, uh, I find that it is really useful for all of us to think of this uh, revolution not just as a European phenomenon, but as something that is entangled in broader uh, sort of uh, global uh, questions of how places are governed, managed, <laughs> controlled, and, and so on and so forth, and that the people who end up in Greece uh, running things uh, have other experiences that they're also bringing to the Greek world, and sometimes from the Greek world will take them somewhere else. Uh, make Precisely. The, Yes. Story so so interesting. A question from uh, uh, Alex Gramatikos. Thank you for your talk. And uh, you spoke about uh, Rigas Ferios's radical republican message in the Union Islands and the printing press which uh, dispersed this message. But of course, Ferios's uh, radicalism was certainly at odds with how the British would have liked to run uh, uh, the islands. Although it's not until the 1830s when the reformist uh, Lord Seton uh, becomes High Commissioner that the Union Islands began to challenge. British rule more openly. I'm wondering what kinds of institutions, practices, and discourses introduced to the Ionian Islands by the British or other Europeans in the 1820s may have been deployed by the Greeks to influence neutral British leaders to intervene in the Greek War of Independence. Uh, well, this is a fairly large question yeah. um, and quite complicated. Some of the institutions that British uh, rule brings in the islands is uh, gradually opening uh, the public sphere. To, uh, but only, not in the 1830s, uh, there are some liberal reforms by Commissioner Douglas in the mid uh, to late 1830s, but Seton actually uh, takes over in 1842 or 44, I think. So there is this uh, time lag between the years of the revolution uh, under which the Ionian state is uh, run in a very um, anti-liberal, I would say, manner following the constitution and its limitations. You know, there's a very small, there's a tiny, minuscule franchise uh, group of people that vote. Uh, everything has to go through the high commissioner or his um, secretary who oversees the uh, proceedings of the Senate, of the, of the seven men, uh, of the five, sorry, men um, uh, government, let's say, or the assembly whenever that sits, three months every two years. And it's, it's run in a very um, authoritarian manner. So there's no liberalism yet. Uh, the, some of the institutions that I think are more uh, long lasting uh, are um, uh, not even the constitution itself. You know, that's not a model. First of all, the Ionians themselves seek to reform it from very early on. Um, they don't achieve that until Seton allows them to in, 18, in late 1840s. Uh, so, uh, some of the practices, uh, perhaps, I mean, the Onion state as a model is, uh, is conducive to, is providing a model for a post-revolutionary war state, only to the extent that, that this would be not uh, fully independent. This is what the act of submission is about, you know, that uh, the British intervene and they, at, at best, if they agreed to go ahead with it, and if the, all the uh, powers, you know, including the Ottomans, of course, agreed to that. It would not include any other territory than the Peloponnese and possibly the Cyclades Islands. So an act of submission that would go ahead uh, would include a, an even smaller Greece than the one that was created in 18, with the border agreement of 1830 and then 32. Uh, so the legacy is... Um, to some extent uh, limited or the influences to the constitution of Greece and its political organization, uh, including the fact that many Greeks, including those who write the constitution, imagine from the beginning that they will have at some point or another a European king. Um, because a king is not so, so as is often called, 
you know, the, the tool, uh, the instrument that will grant uh, the uh, revolutionaries and different factions in Greece as a whole legitimacy. It is considered a, a mechanism that will bring in balance to the different and sometimes oppositional factions, uh, which is what happens elsewhere in Europe or um, or, or beyond. So that's why uh, the Greeks uh, have a very different uh, imagination about what kind of state they will have. Not everyone agrees to that, of course, uh, but uh, the king is never really you know, challenged. Even Capodistrias, when he gets elected in 1827 and with a term of seven years uh, ahead of him, he, is, he knows by 1830 that a king is being... Um, uh, the, the Greeks are looking and the foreign powers are looking for a king. So he's, he knows, and he wasn't exactly against it. Uh, and he knows he's uh, forming a transitional uh, government or rule. So uh, you're being very generous with your thorough um, answers to the questions. And so. uh, we certainly do not want to exhaust you, but I have four questions for you before okay. we wrap up. Um, the first from uh, uh, Angelis. Uh, thank you for this very rich talk, Sakis. I would like to ask you uh, to ask, uh, would you see Metland's humanitarian towards the refugees as uh, proceeding from the political diplomatic shift in British foreign policy in 1823 towards the Greek question or simply as a very 18th uh, century absolutist humanitarianism, but not necessarily willing to recognize Greeks as a nation? Thank you again. Uh, thanks to Agelis. I think the, the latter. Um, I don't think that Metland is, um, is following so closely the, the changes, the shift, uh, the gradual shift in uh, foreign policy. Uh, perhaps he does, but I think he's more influenced by considerations, the 18th century, as you called it, uh, kinds of uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, less so uh, than um, in a different way than the humanitarian uh, humanitarianism that evolves in uh, the US, for example, with the shipment of um, uh, provisions of foodstuff in 1827, 28, uh, with Miller and uh, Jeffrey Howe, uh, which of course is a different humanitarianism. It, it, it has the religious connotations, you know, but this time there's sort of a Protestant missionary uh, connotations to a certain extent, but broadly humanitarian. So yeah, I think his, his um, reaction to providing a refuge, a safe uh, haven from the war in Akarnania and Tolia in continental Greece, is guided primarily uh, from this uh, sort of very um, uh, um, straightforward idea that you know he should save lives, just as he is though towards the Muslim uh, refugees that arrive in Kithira or uh, Zakynthos. So I think it's it's he tries to keep a, a balanced um, policy. Uh, thank you. Uh, a question from uh, Vicky Vasiliou. Uh, part of it is uh, recapping on some uh, uh, of the things we've discussed and part of it uh, new. Uh, did the Ionians, particularly from Corfu and Cafalonia, consider themselves as Hellenes at the time of the, uh, just running up to the revolution? And did they speak the Greek language? Uh, I'd also like to know how uh, ancient Greek history was preserved uh, in the Ottoman years. Now, the second is a huge question. <laughs> yes, I think I will pass on the second one. Um, it's easier for me to answer the time allowed, of course, obviously. Mm -hmm. The first one, uh, there is a language, the linguistic uh, diversity in the Onion Islands that, is, that partly reflects uh, the social, cultural, uh, broadly uh, outlook of the islands. So. Uh, the cities, especially Corfu and uh, Zakynthos, and to some extent Argostoli and Luxuri, um, many people speak Italian, and especially write in Italian. Uh, many people, especially the Jewish population, uh, speaks primarily Italian. Uh, in Corfu, up to three, four thousand uh, Corfu Jews, and in the island of Zakynthos, more than a thousand, perhaps. Uh, the countryside is overwhelmingly Greek speaking uh, of the Ionian dialect. Um, the case of Solomos is well known that he goes around, you know, uh, uh, when he uh, goes back to the island uh, from Italy, uh, to his native island, Zakynthos, he goes around and collects uh, words, you know, from, uh, from the peasants. So he's learning a, particularly, a particular idiom uh, of, uh, of Greek. Uh, that is um, that is typical of the Onion Islands, maybe perhaps at the time with some uh, differences that range that vary from uh, island to island. Uh, 
uh, but even the Italian uh, dialect is the uh, Italian Venetian that uh, many Ionians uh, spoke and definitely uh, wrote in. So the, the question, for instance, from a sort of institutional point of view comes again and again of when are, uh, is Greek going to be introduced in the Ionian Islands uh, administration? Because they have a, although it's in the first constitution of 1817, there's a law again in 1820, uh, but it's it is even, I think at the, at the end, only in the 1840s, they switched to fully Greek in all documents, including the courts. So until then, the Ionian state is probably trilingual in some respects. So Italian, uh, Greek in the administration and the courts at least, and for uh, some purposes, Greek English too. Uh, and that actually is a model that, you know, it could, it could happen in Greece too. You know, had, did we, had we have... Uh, in, in instead a different sort of outcome of the Greek revolution or a different uh, state that would include, you know, its Muslim uh, population or would uh, allow for the sort of Albanian language to, to flourish in the, in the sense that, you know, so many uh, Greek nationals by 1820s, 1830s spoke Albanian, uh, then it could have had a different, um, uh, a different result uh, there too. But then again, you know, people have said that, you know, with so many people, uh, who spoke Albanian at the time, or both, uh, Greek, Albanian, and Turkish, uh, the Greek state was multilingual, but it has not been acknowledged as such. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll close with the last two questions that are in a way uh, tied together and tie with something you mentioned earlier. So Anastasios uh, Adamopoulos and Marcia Economopoulos uh, ask, uh, what was the economic significance of the Ionian Islands from the point of view of the British Empire? Did they serve as a trading outpost in the Mediterranean? And the second uh, question by Marsha is, uh, since there was a small but prominent uh, Jewish presence to which you uh, referred in the Ionian Islands, especially Corfu uh, and Zakynthos, and since the Jews were involved in banking under the Venetians, would this enterprise have had carried over under British rule? I will start with the second, yes, is the short answer. Um, many Jews, but the, the majority of Jews are not bankers or traders. They are port workers, uh, they're tailors, they, they do menial work, uh, they're workers in, in many cases, and they live in, in uh, the city of Corfu uh, only, or Zykenthos. Um, uh, Tasso's point, thank you. It's, it, it's a much broader question. The economic significance of the Ottoman Empire, of the, of the uh, islands with, for the British Empire is small, and it gets smaller as uh, the Greek state becomes uh, more established in the region. In terms of, uh, for instance, after 1839, that uh, signed its treaty with the Ottoman Empire, allowing Greek ships to move more freely and goods to be traded more freely with Ottoman ports. But this follows the 1838 um, uh, treaty between the British Empire and the Ottoman Empire. So this is a much larger context, uh, commercial, uh, and um, economic uh, more broadly. So the significance of the Ionian Islands is uh, small only, but uh, it's more important locally. So it is not in large in numbers for the you know, huge uh, volume and value of uh, British colonial trade, but it is important locally because the Ionian Islands, especially Corfu, becomes a free port in 1825. This is one of the most crucial years of the revolution. And the British emerge, imagine that Corfu will be a free port for the whole region, which, me, which means that a lot of goods are stored in transit to other markets nearby. So they elevate Corfu to something that Livorno was at the time in the Mediterranean. Uh, so for grain that is coming from the Black Sea and for goods that come are imported uh, to the islands from Britain, and then they are sent to other markets in Epirus, as south as Patras, and the mainland Greece, the Greek state after its uh, independence. So the regional significance is, is big, uh, but not, of course, of the overall uh, uh, trade, you know, of the uh, of British Empire. Uh, so uh, with that, we, we wrap up our, um, our set of questions. Uh, and I would like to really thank our, um, our speaker for what was uh, an excellent presentation and uh, uh, one of the richest uh, discussions uh, uh, we've had uh, in, a, in, a, in our uh, speaker series. Uh, this is uh, really apropos for the celebration of uh, the 200 years, if you wish, of the modern Greek state. Uh, and of course, uh, a conversation cannot happen without our uh, audience who actively uh, participated and joined uh, 
uh, in uh, in this talk. I would like to thank you for uh, uh, supporting us through your presence, uh, both in this event and in uh, many others we've, uh, we've held uh, over the years. And since we're speaking about um, uh, events, uh, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that uh, our center's next uh, event will take place uh, this coming uh, Tuesday, March uh, 9th, and will be part of the fifth uh, annual Edward and Emily McQueenie uh, lecture series. Our speaker for uh, uh, this year is Professor Roman Yerodimos from Bournemouth University, and his talk is titled, Is There a Future for the, quote, West? European Security, the Transatlantic Alliance, and the Role of Values in the New World uh, Disorder. Uh, you can uh, uh, register online. You can go on the Hellenic Studies uh, website or send an email to hscom, uh, two Ms, at uh, sfu.ca. Uh, again, if, uh, if I may, I would like to thank you as well uh, again and the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the very kind invitation and the opportunity to present uh, some ideas and uh, thank everyone who uh, was here in this virtual room uh, and uh, all the best to everyone and stay well. Thank oh, you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Saki. And I think that uh, this is also uh, uh, this also speaks to the uh, possibilities for uh, further discussions on all these uh, questions. And hopefully pandemic, uh, pandemic be done. Uh, we can uh, travel and uh, 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 speak face to face and converse face to face. Thanks, everyone. This is the end of uh, uh, today's uh, uh, event. Have a very nice afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye.